Chapter Twenty Seven of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After the victory, the Ghost's Win was popular, although the horse was by no means a favourite. Racing men, however, are not slow to recognise the win of a horse whose owner is known to be a straight goer. Just my luck," said Mister Forrester as he met Ted Bryce going across the paddock to see his horse rub down he was a man who could take a defeat as well as a victory i can't say i wish you had won said ted bryce with a smile so i will say better luck next time i hope so said mr forrester as he moved on to look after his own horse what sort of a ride had you said ted bryce to parker not an easy one at the finish by any means was the reply i only just got home i had to nurse him all down the street he's a real good colt i should not be at all surprised if there was a melbourne cup in him you appear to be taking it easy at the finish said ted bryce i never rode a better finish said parker i dared not move on the colt he would have lost had i not sat still and let him fight it out the colt was doing his best he could do no more sam fraser was elated at the win and felt his luck was in it was amusing to see how he smiled upon the other trainers he had his turn now, and chaffed them unmercifully. "'You'll have to catch the phantom somehow,' said Fraser to Ted Bryce, "'or you'll have men losing their good mares in the district for a few weeks in order to get a foal by him.' "'I'm sure he will never be caught,' said Ted. "'For my part, he can run wild until he dies of old age. "'If ever I come across him when he's knocked up, "'he shall have a painless death and an honourable burial. "'And at Munda you will find his hoofs upon the table his hide upon the chair i wish he could be caught what stock you would get if mated properly said fraser he gets them all right now replied ted and picks his own mares there's a heap of luck in breeding horses they were a merry party at the australia hotel that night and ted bryce's rooms were decorated for the occasion the great race of the day was talked over again and the merits of the ghost descanted upon telegram for you sir said the waiter as he entered the room just as dinner was over ted bryce took it and said congratulations i suppose on the win the wire was from louth and signed wide awake we're all drinking the ghost's health tonight and also your own manda is a scene of wild hilarity ted bryce laughed as he handed the telegram to his sister and Ida read it aloud. "'They will be having a good time,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'The revels will be prolonged until midnight, I expect.' "'And after,' said Ida Bryce, "'the manda hands know how to play as well as work.' The waiter entered the room with another telegram. "'More congratulations, I suppose,' said Ted. He gave an exclamation of surprise as he read the information it contained. "'What is it?' asked Ida. "'Anything wrong?' this is a go said ted what a curious thing it should happen on this particular day we can now celebrate another victory but what has happened ted why don't you tell us said ida impatiently it's from melbourne said ted i'll read it herbert golding arrested this afternoon on board the tayan will arrive in sydney on wednesday that is news exclaimed ida i'm glad the scoundrel is caught and so am i said ted bryce he shall have no mercy from me i wonder how he will face it said wyndham hanworth he'll brazen it out right enough said ted bryce what a hypocritical scoundrel he is herbert golding's arrest was soon heard of in sydney and special editions of the evening papers came out with imaginary accounts of the scene on board the tayan as a matter of fact the arrest had been accomplished quietly Herbert Golding intended escaping to China, and had assumed a disguise and booked his passage by the Tayan under a false name. When arrested, he saw the game was up, and that it would be in his favour to take matters quietly. He had read the accounts of the confession of Eli Spence, and saw how badly it would tell against him, but he had nothing to fear as regards being implicated in the death of Henry Bryce. He shuddered as he thought of the scene he had witnessed that night at Balmain. Could he have prevented the murder of Henry Bryce? 
he knew he could have done so and therefore he was morally guilty of a crime in not saving him at last the truth came home to him that he was at heart a murderer the thought was not pleasant even such a man as herbert golding has his hours of remorse as the train sped on its way from albury to sydney he had ample time for reflection it was not the punishment he dreaded so much as the thought that during his long imprisonment he would be haunted by the memory of that fatal night when his too generous partner henry bryce had been murdered in his presence he knew what a feeling of relief came over him when he saw henry bryce fall into the water only that very week had henry bryce discovered his herbert golding's perfidy and that a large sum of money had been taken out of the firm by means of forgery herbert golding knew he had been glad when henry bryce was found dead in the harbour but now his day of reckoning had come the enormity of his misdeeds appalled him what was there he had not done he had sat sunday after sunday facing the ten commandments in church hearing them read aloud he had said the response after each commandment in a loud clear voice he intended it should be known that he at all events wished to incline his heart to keep this law could he say now that there was one of those commandments he had kept no he could not thou shalt not steal he had stolen he had borne false witness he had murdered in his heart and he had coveted his neighbour's wife he had worshipped an idol he had set up and that idol was himself he had cloaked his sins with religion he had desecrated the church by his presence within it ted bryce had said herbert golding would brazen it out he was mistaken when herbert golding left melbourne he felt he could brazen it out at that time he was five hundred miles away from sydney and the people he had wronged and deceived but as the train drew nearer and nearer to the scene of his iniquities his brazen courage if it can be called courage in such a man forsook him as every mile left behind took him onward to sydney he feared the ordeal that lay before him it was not repentance for his crimes he felt had he been able to escape he would have done so and lived a life of deception and hypocrisy elsewhere but there was no chance of this he could not escape alive what he feared was facing the crowded court and the eager faces glaring at him and demanding justice upon him he dreaded to face the men he had deceived with his canting phrases and mock morality he dreaded facing the sneers of men who had held subordinate positions to himself in the commercial world he pictured to himself the utter contempt in which all these people would hold him and point at him as a sneaking hypocritical thief he could not face that ordeal he must escape even if he had to take his life he was a coward to the bitter end he dared not face the consequences of his own misdeeds when the train stopped for the passengers to have breakfast herbert golding asked the detective who had charge of him to join him at that meal the detective saw no harm in this and they went into the breakfast room at the station herbert golding chatted freely with the man and seemed quite at his ease and reconciled to his position the detective also talked to the man who sat on the opposite side of him to his prisoner he did not see herbert golding quickly slip a knife up his sleeve when they left the room herbert golding walked up the platform with the detective towards their carriage he was not handcuffed as the man in charge of him did not consider this to be necessary until they reached sydney as they were passing a waiting-room herbert golding suddenly rushed inside and slammed the door in the astonished detective's face the detective at once made a dash at the door behind that door with his back against it and the lock turned stood herbert golding in an instant he slipped the knife down his sleeve and grasping the handle with tremendous force drew the blade across his throat the detective forced open the door herbert golding fell face forwards and the knife turning as it fell with him and the handle striking the floor on end the blade ran into his chest 
the detective seeing what had happened left his prisoner and rushed onto the platform shouting for a doctor there happened to be a medical man in the train but he had no desire to be left behind what is it he asked with his head out of the carriage window man cut his throat in the waiting room come quickly or he'll bleed to death said the detective i shall miss my train said the doctor no you will not they will wait for you replied the detective with protestations on his part the doctor got out of the carriage and hurried along the platform the train was detained to see if the injured man could still be taken on the doctor quickly saw there was no hope for herbert golding and he was not at all well pleased when the train departed leaving him there herbert golding did not speak again he had taken the law into his own hands and passed sentence upon himself the wound in his chest was a fatal one as the knife blade had pierced his lung the throat was terribly lacerated the knife having been worn at the point and blunted towards the haft he died the same night and the detective had to convey a dead prisoner to sydney herbert golding's suicide people said was in accordance with his mode of living he had been a cheat all his life and now he had cheated his victims who would much have preferred seeing him alive in the dock edward bryce was astonished when he heard the news he took it differently to most people he had meant to have a day of reckoning with herbert golding but now the man had taken his own life that was impossible he's dead said ted bryce to wyndham hanworth and therefore he's given a life for a life for he was morally guilty of my father's death now i come to think it over i am glad this has happened there would have been many unpleasant details at the trial and the judgment pronounced upon him would not have been so severe as that he has meted out to himself it is a miserable end to a wretched life so herbert golding paid the penalty for his crimes mrs bryce was naturally much shocked at the news edward bryce thought she had been sufficiently punished and informed her that her thirty thousand pounds was safe in the firm of bryce and company this assuaged her grief considerably and she commenced to praise herbert golding for withdrawing her money from the bank but when edward bryce explained to her that the thirty thousand she had handed over to herbert golding was used by him to pay back a sum of exactly the same amount of which he had defrauded henry bryce she was indignant against the dead man edward bryce also explained to her that she could not withdraw the money and as a matter of fact it did not belong to her at all but he was willing considering she was his father's widow to allow her five per cent on the amount during her lifetime that interest to cease if she married again mrs bryce found much to ponder over in all this and she arrived at the conclusion that her stepson was a hard-hearted young man and could have no feelings for her lonely position when he made such a stipulation as the one of not to marry again end of chapter 27「Of Who Did It」by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Munda once more. Six months after the events narrated in the previous chapter, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Bryce were entertaining a party of guests at Munda. Included in those staying under their hospitable roof were Ida Bryce, Wyndham Hanworth, Dr. Langside, William Sellers, and his daughter Laura. The marriage of Edward Bryce and Flora Hanworth had taken place three months previously, and after a short honeymoon they had come on to Munda, where Wide Awake, who was now holding a responsible position there, had organised a hearty reception for them. Edward Bryce was anxious his sister should marry Wyndham Hanworth. He knew it would be unwise for him to urge Wyndham's claims to Ida, but he thought if they came together at Munda again, it would give the artist the opportunity he desired. There was plenty of amusement at Munda. The shooting was excellent, and as the country was now in splendid condition, it presented a very different aspect to what it did at the time of the memorable attack on Munda. There was also good fishing to be had in the Darling River, and any amount of horses to ride. 
riding parties were much in favour and seldom a day passed without most of the guests having an exhilarating gallop over the great level paddocks races were got up for the benefit of the hands and wide awake greatly astonished some of the juniors by winning a prize of five and twenty pounds which edward bryce had given for a two miles race the phantom had not been seen for many weeks and ted bryce commenced to think the horse must have met with some mishap dr langside was very anxious to catch a glimpse of the celebrated sire of the ghost and so was william sellers a search party was organised and with wide awake in command as on a former occasion they rode out to find the phantom horse it was a long ride and an arduous search and nothing came of it no trace of the old horse could be found and they had to return to Munda after an unsuccessful ride. Next day they went out again, and as Ida Bryce did not feel particularly well, she decided to remain at home with Flora. Wyndham Hanworth had gone off by himself on a sketching bent. This time the riding party was more successful, for they tracked the phantom to one of his favourite haunts. Here they found the old horse, lying on the grass with four mares standing round him, and gazing at him with startled looks when the mares caught sight of the approaching horsemen they galloped off but the phantom could not rise although he made desperate efforts to get on to his feet his struggles were painful to witness and it was evident the old horse had finished his final gallop what a pity said ted as he looked at the fallen hero he's injured his spine no by jove his back's broken he must have had a nasty fall but however did he manage to get here i think he'd better be shot said wide awake it will put an end to his misery he may have been like this for a considerable time they looked sorrowfully on and ted bryce said yes it will be better to put an end to his suffering shoot him wide awake the report of a gun discharged echoed through the hollows and without a struggle the old phantom died what a magnificent horse he must have been in his prime said william sellers now one day his stock can race ted bryce examined him closely but could find no brand nor other marks of ownership upon him they covered up the remains of the phantom with branches and ted bryce told wide awake to send a man from the station to get the hide and the hoofs which he intended to preserve as a memento of the old grey that's a horse with a history said dr langside as they rode back to munda if his career could be traced it would form interesting reading there may be a chance of finding out all about him said edward bryce if ever i do make any discoveries in that direction i will see they are made public when wyndham hanworth felt tired of sketching he returned to the homestead and he saw ida bryce alone on the veranda something seemed to tell him it was now or never if he wished to win ida bryce so he determined to make the plunge having had but little experience in such delicate matters the artist hardly knew how to commence business he had however a straightforward nature and generally said what he thought without any circumlocution Ida Bryce heard him step onto the veranda and looked up. She instinctively knew what he had come to say to her, and it made her heart flutter slightly, despite her self-control. "'You have returned early,' she said, by way of opening a commonplace conversation. "'I'm glad I've found you alone,' commenced Wyndham. And then, with a boldness and suddenness that startled Ida Bryce, the artist declared his love for her. He pleaded earnestly and in a manly way there was something masterful about him that attracted ida she thought she had never seen him look so handsome or heard him speak so well she had long liked wyndham hanworth and now she knew that liking had developed into love he spoke without hesitation or diffidence he had confidence in his own powers and he said if ida bryce would consent to be his wife he would try and make for himself a name that would be worthy of her and when Ida Bryce replied, she spoke openly and truthfully. She let Wyndham Hanworth see that if he married her, he must accept what help she could give him to win fame in the career he had chosen. 
she accepted his offer and promised to be his wife, and then, after struggling hard to keep back her emotional feelings, she, woman-like, gave way. Wyndham Hanworth made the most of this opportunity, and Edward Bryce would have had no cause to give him further hints as to the boldness of his wooing. When Ted Bryce saw his sister, he knew there was a change in her. "'You look better, Ida,' he said. "'The rest has done you good. "'If I was given to flattery, I should say you were looking radiant. "'Has anything happened?' he asked as he saw a bright light in her eyes. "'A good deal has happened, Ted, since you left home this morning,' said Ida. "'It was mean of you to leave me in such an unprotected state.' "'Has Wyndham screwed up his courage at last?' said Ted with a laugh. "'If you mean has he proposed to me,' said Ida, "'he has.' and I have accepted him. Ted Bryce kissed her fondly, and said he knew she would be happy with his friend. Flora Bryce soon saw her brother was in very high spirits. What has pleased you so much today, Wynne? I'm the luckiest man in the world, he said. Ida has consented to be my wife. Flora Bryce was as delighted almost as her brother at this good news. Now use keeping it a secret, said Ted Bryce, and forthwith he proceeded to enlighten his guests as to what had taken place during their absence. "'I call it real mean of Wynne to go and steal my sister during our unavoidable absence,' he said. "'You don't suppose we required your presence as a spectator of the interesting proceedings?' said Ida with a smile. "'Not if you were as enthusiastic as the usual run of lovers,' said Ted." I should never feel I was engaged if Wyndham had proposed to me in an off-hand manner on a railway station platform, said Ida, with a glance at Flora. I don't see why a railway station platform is not as good a place as the veranda of Munda Homestead, said Ted. Who told you it was on the veranda? asked Ida. Wynne, of course, said Ted. He's quite proud of his bravery, I assure you. If Wyndham has been giving you a full, true and particular account of all that took place on the veranda, I shall never forgive him, said Ida. I assure you, Ida, your brother is drawing upon his imagination, said Wyndham. That scene is sacred to me. Bravo, shouted Ted. How would this do for a subject for a picture? One on a veranda. Or caught at the railway station, said Ida with a merry laugh. The poor old phantom's dead said Ted, and he described how they had found the horse. "'Oh, I am sorry,' said Flora, "'but we have the ghost to remind us of him.' That night, Wyndham Hanworth and Edward Bryce had a quiet chat together. "'And when is the wedding to be?' asked Ted. "'I will leave it entirely to Ida,' said Wyndham. "'Take my advice and do nothing of the kind,' said Ted Bryce. "'Choose the date and stick to it.' "'But will Ida like that?' asked Wynne. "'Ida is a sensible woman, and will like what you like,' said Ted. "'Then the sooner the better,' said Wyndham. "'I agree with you heartily,' said Ted. "'Get it over quick, and settle down into a quiet married couple, like Flora and myself.' "'I mean to work hard,' said Wyndham. "'Nothing like it,' said Ted. "'And I'm sure Ida will help you.' "'By the by, Ted, did I tell you?' said Wyndham. "'What is it? You look quite desperate.' said Ted. I've destroyed those paintings of Herbert Golding. I never felt as much satisfaction in painting a picture as I did in burning those portraits. I'm glad you've done so, said Ted. It was an unprofitable commission you received. It was. I will never accept another commission to paint a man I do not like, said the artist. You'll have no necessity to do so now, Wynne, said Ted Bryce. Thanks to Ida, I shall not, said Wyndham. "'We are lucky men, Wynne,' said Ted. "'We are,' said Wyndham Hanworth. "'I have won Ida.' "'And I have won Flora,' said Ted Bryce. End of chapter 28 End of Who Did It? by Nat Gould Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia